chapter nine of all along the river this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org all along the river by mary elizabeth braddon chapter nine lies nothing buried long ago like most small country settlements little fraternities of well-to-do people who think themselves the beginning and end of the world trelasco was slow to rise to any festivity in the way of party giving so it was about two months after colonel disney's return before the friendly calls and interchange of small civilities culminated in a dinner party at glenaveril it seemed indeed only right and natural that the great house of the district great by reason of lord lostwithiel's non-residence should be the first to open its doors in a ceremonial manner to the colonel and his womankind the invitation to his sister might be taken as an especial compliment arms outstretched to receive one who was a stranger in the land we want to know that nice young sister of yours mr crowther said to colonel disney in his patronizing way as they all came out of church the sunday before the dinner party a remarkably fine girl the colonel did not thank him for this compliment which was pronounced in a loud voice amidst the little knot of acquaintances taking leave of each other on the dip of the hill where there was a signpost on a patch of waste grass and where road and lanes divided one up the hill to tyward wreath another to fowry and a narrow wooded lane leading down to glenaveril and the angler's nest short as the distance was there were carriages waiting for the crowthers who never walked to church however fine the weather mrs crowther came to the morning service resplendent in a brocade gown and a parisian bonnet on pain of being condemned as dowdy by her husband who liked to put the stamp of his wealth upon every detail his wife obeyed him with wifely meekness but the daughters were not so easily ruled both were keen-witted enough to feel the vulgarity of sunday morning splendour so belinda worshipped in the exaggerated simplicity of an unstarched jaconet muslim a yellow liberty sash a flopping gainsborough hat and a necklace of indian beads an attire which attracted every eye and was a source of wonder to the whole congregation while alicia's neat grey cashmere frock and smart little toque to match grey gloves grey prayer-book and sunshade challenged criticism as a study in monochrome mr crowther would have lingered for further conversation before getting into the family landau but colonel disney bade a rather abrupt good morning to the whole group and hurried his wife and sister down the hill i'm rather sorry we accepted the glenaveril invitation he said to isola the man is such an unmitigated cad mrs crowther is very kind and good replied his wife but i have never cared much about going to glenaveril i don't feel that i get on particularly well with the girls they are both too fine for me but i should be sorry to offend mrs crowther yes she seems a kindly creature it was thoughtful of her sending you a ticket for the ball a woman with daughters is seldom over kind to outsiders oh i believe mrs crowther's heart is big enough to be kind to a whole parish well on her account perhaps it was best to accept the invitation don't be so grand about it martin said allegra you forget that i am pining to see what a dinner-party in a very rich house is like i have seen nothing in london but literary and artistic dinners third-rate literary and third-rate artistic i'm afraid but they were very nice all the same glenaveril is a place that takes my breath away and i am curious to see what a dinner-party can be like there 
then for your sake allegra i'm glad we said yes only i couldn't stand that fellow patronizing you calling you a fine girl forsooth yes it is an odious phrase is it not i'm afraid i shall have to live through it because like rosalind i am more than common tall she drew herself up to her full height straight as a reed but with fully developed bust and shoulders which showed to advantage in her pale to sorry gown silk that her brother had sent her from india she looked the incarnation of girlish innocence and girlish happiness a brow without a cloud a step light as a fawn's a fearless joyous nature her more commonplace features and finer figure were in curious contrast with isola's pensive beauty and too fragile form disney glanced from one to the other as he walked along the rustic lane between them and though he thought his wife the lovelier he regretted that she was not more like his sister a man who is very fond of home and who has no professional cares and occupations is apt to degenerate into a molly coddle martin disney gave an indication of this weakness on the day before the dinner at glenaveril what are you two girls going to wear he asked at least i don't think i need ask isola that question you'll wear your wedding gown of course love he added turning to his wife no martin i'm going to wear my grey silk grey a dowager's colour a soured spinster's colour a quaker's no colour i detest grey oh but this is a very pretty gown the palest shade of pearl colour and i wear pink roses with it it was made in paris i feel sure you will like me in it martin isla said hurriedly as if even this small matter fluttered her nerves not as well as i like you in your wedding gown that was made in paris and it fitted you like a glove i never saw such a pretty gown so simple yet so elegant i have been married much too long to dress as a bride you shall not seem as a bride except to me for my eyes only shall you shine in bridal loveliness bride or no bride what can be prettier for a young woman than a white satin gown with a long train you can wear some touch of colour to show you have not got yourself up as a bride what do you say allegra give us your opinion of course you are an authority upon dress oh the white satin by all means isola looks ethereal in white she ought hardly ever to wear anything else you hear isa two to one against you i'm sorry i can't be governed by your opinions in this instance you forget that i last wore my gown at a ball i danced a good deal the floor was dirty the gown was spoilt i shall never wear it again i hope that will satisfy you martin she spoke with a touch of temper her cheeks flushed crimson and her eyes filled with sudden tears as she looked deprecatingly at her husband martin disney felt himself a brute my dearest i didn't mean to tease you he said wear anything you like you are sure to be the prettiest woman in the room i am sorry the gown was spoilt but it can't be helped i'll buy you another white satin gown the first time you and i are in plymouth together and pray miss allegra what bravery will you sport i have only a white lace frock that has seen some service replied his sister meekly i dare say i shall look like somebody's poor relation at such a place as glenaveril oh it's not to be a grand party by any means mrs crowther told me she had asked the bainhams and the vicarage people to meet us just in a friendly way the party was decidedly small for on arriving with reasonable punctuality the disneys found only one guest on the scene in the person of mr colfox the curate who was sitting by one of the little tables showing a new puzzle of two pieces of interlinked iron to the two misses crowther these young ladies were so interested in the trick of disentanglement that they scarcely noticed the entrance of their mother's guests and only rose and came over to greet the party three minutes later as an afterthought 
mr and mrs crowther however were both upon the alert to receive their friends the lady frankly cordial the gentleman swelling with pompous friendliness as if his manly breast were trying to emerge from the moderate restriction of a very open waistcoat he protested that he was charmed to welcome colonel disney to glenaveril and he glanced round the splendid walls as who should say it is no light thing to invite people to such a house as this van sittart crowther was a man of short squat figure who tried to make up for the want of inches by extreme uprightness and had cultivated this carriage until he seemed incapable of bending he had a bald head disguised by one dappled streak of grey and sandy hair which was plastered into a curl on each side of his brow curls faintly suggestive of a cat's ears he had blunt features a sensual lip and dull fishy eyes large and protuberant with an expression in perfect harmony with the heavy sensual mouth mr and mrs bainham were the next arrivals the lady wearing the family amethysts and the well-known black velvet under whose weighty splendour she arrived short of breath the gentleman expansive of shirt front and genial of aspect jovial at the prospect of a good dinner and choice wines and not hypercritical as to the company in which he ate the feast he shook hands with his host and hostess and then went over to the misses crowthers who had not thought it necessary to suspend their absorbing occupation in order to welcome the village doctor's wife a fact which mrs bainham observed and inwardly resented mr colfox deserted the young lady still puzzling over the two bits of iron and went across the room to greet the disneys he was an intelligent young man steeped to the lips in the opinions and the prejudices of university life oxford life that is to say he ranked as a literary man in trelasco on the strength of having had an article almost published in blackwood the editor had accepted my paper he told people modestly but on further consideration he found it was a little too long and so in point of fact he sent it back to me in the most courteous manner he couldn't have acted more kindly but i was disappointed it would have been such an opening you see all mr colfox's friends agreed that with such an opening the high road to literary fame and fortune would have been made smooth for his feet they respected him even for this disappointment to have been accepted by blackwood made him almost a colleague of george eliot he was a tall and rather lean young man who wore an eyeglass and seemed to live upon books it was irritating to van sittart crowther who prided himself on his cellar and his cook to note how little impression food and drink made upon francis colfox he takes my chateau equem as if it were devonshire cider said the aggrieved parvenu and he hardly seems to know that this is the only house where he ever sees clear turtle the man's people must have lived in a very poor way in spite of this contemptuous opinion mr crowther was always polite to francis colfox and had even thought of him as a pis aller for one of his daughters there is hardly anything in this life which a self-made man respects so much as race and francis colfox belonged to an old county family had a cousin who was an earl and another cousin who was talked of as a probable bishop he was therefore allowed to make himself very much at home at glenaveril and to speak his mind in a somewhat audacious way to the whole family captain pentreath an army man of uncertain age a bachelor and one of a territorial family of many brothers came next and then appeared the vicar and his wife and one daughter who made up the party the vicar was deaf but amiable and beamed benevolently upon a world about whose spoken opinions he knew so little that he might naturally have taken it for a much better world than it is 
the vicar's wife spent her existence in interpreting and explaining people's speech to the vicar and had no time to spare for opinions of her own the daughter was characterized by a gentle nullity tempered by a somewhat enthusiastic and evangelical piety the chief desire of her life was to keep the church as it had been in the days of her childhood nearly thirty years before it was the first time the disneys had dined together at glenaveril so it seemed only proper that mr crowther should give his arm to isola which he did with an air of conferring an honour the colonel had been ordered to take the vicar's wife and the doctor was given to allegra captain pentreath took miss trequite the vicar's daughter mr colfox followed with mrs baynham and the daughters of the house went modestly to the dining-room after the vicar and mrs crowther the dinner-table was as pretty as roses and venetian glass could make it there was no pompous display of ponderous plate as there might have been thirty years ago on a parvenu's board everybody is enlightened nowadays the great culture movement has been as widespread among the middle class as compulsory education among the proletariat and everybody has a taste scarcely were they seated when mr crowther informed mrs disney that he hated a display of silver but at the same time took care to let her know that the venetian glass she admired was rather more valuable than that precious metal and if it's broken there's nothing left you for your outlay he said but it's a fancy of my wife and girls those decanters are better than anything salviati ever made for royalty the table was oval lighted by one large lamp under an umbrella-shaped amber shade a lamp which diffused a faint golden glow through the dusky room and through this dreamy dimness the footmen moved like ghosts while the table and the faces of the diners shone and sparkled in the brilliant light it was as picturesque a dining-room and table as one need care to see and if the gainsboroughs and reynoldses which here and there relieved the sombre russet of the cordovan leather hangings were not the portraits of mr and mrs crowther's ancestors they were not the less lovely or interesting as works of art isola sat by her host's side with a silent and somewhat embarrassed air which her husband noted as he watched her from the other side of the table all the decorations were low so that no pyramid of fruit or flowers intervened to prevent a man watching the face opposite to him disney saw that while allegra in her place between mr baynham and alicia crowther was full of talk and animation isola sat with downcast eyes and replied with a troubled look to her host's remarks there was something in that gentleman's manner which was particularly obnoxious to the colonel a protecting air a fatherly familiarity which brought the bald shining forehead almost in contact with isola's shoulder as the man bent to whisper and to titter in the very ear of his neighbour the colonel got through a little duty talk with mrs trequite whose attention was frequently distracted by the necessity of explaining mrs crowther's polite murmurs to the vicar on the other side of the table and this duty done he gave himself up to watching isola and her host why did she blush so when the man talked to her was it the bold admiration of those fishy eyes which annoyed her or the man's manner altogether or was it anything that he said disney strained his ears to hear their conversation if that could be called conversation which was for the most part monologue the man was talking of the hunt ball of last winter disney heard such snatches of speech as the prettiest woman in the room everybody said so lost with you was evidently a prix mr crowther had a penchant for scraps of french which decorated his speech as truffles adorn a boned turkey isn't it odd that he should be such a rover he asked in a less confidential tone than before 
isla looked up at him as if hardly understanding the question i mean lost with you with such a nice place as he has here it seems a pity to be broiling himself in peru i never could understand the taste for orchids and in his case well i hardly believe in it he is the last man to emulate a hooker or a lawrence orchid hunting must be an excuse for keeping away from england i take it don't you think so now mrs disney i really don't know you don't know why he should want to keep away no no more does anybody else only we all wonder don't you know he talked to me of settling down in the county looked after the estate a little he even hinted that he might in due course cast about for a nice young wife with a little money and then all of a sudden off he sails in that rakish yacht of his and roves from port to port like the flying dutchman in the opera till at last we hear of him, hear of him on the coast of peru curious ain't it mrs disney why curious asked isola coldly was not lord lostwithiel always fond of yachting no doubt but when a man talks of settling down in his native place and then doesn't do it there must be a reason mustn't there i don't know people act as often from caprice as from reason ah that is a lady's idea no man who is worthy the name ever acts from caprice said mr crowther with his insinuating air as if some hidden meaning were in the words and then looking across the table and seeing the colonel's watchful face he altered both tone and manner as he added of course you know lost with you colonel disney i saw a good deal of lord lost with you when he was a small boy answered the colonel coldly his father was one of my early friends but that is a long time ago how old is he do you say debrett will answer that question better than i can i have never reckoned the years that have gone by since i saw him in an eaton collar the men did not sit long over their wine the doctor and his host talked agriculture mr crowther discussing all farming operations upon a large scale as became a man of territorial magnitude the vicar prosed about an approaching lecture at the schoolroom and utterly failed in hearing anything that was said in reply to his observations colonel disney smoked a cigarette in silence and with a moody brow later in the drawing-room while the crowther girls were playing a clamorous duet by the last fashionable sclavonic composer van zetart crowther directed his conversation almost wholly to mrs disney as if she were the only person worthy of his attention he was full of suggestions for future gaieties in which the disneys were to share picnics boating parties you must help us to wake up the neighbourhood colonel he said addressing disney with easy friendliness we are not very likely to be of much assistance to you in that line disney answered coldly we are quiet stay-at-home people my wife and i and take our pleasures on a very small scale colonel disney's carriage was announced at this moment he gave his wife a look which plainly indicated his wish to depart and she rose quickly from the low deep chair in which she had been sitting in some manner a captive while mr crowther lolled across the broad plush cushioned arm to talk to her allegra was engrossed in a talk about william morris's last poem with mr colfox who was delighted to converse with any one fresh from the far-away world of art and literature delighted altogether with allegra whose whole being presented a piquant contrast to the miss crowthers but the colonel's sister saw the movement towards departure and hastened to her brother's side briefest adieu followed and the first of the guests being gone left behind them a feeling of uneasiness in those whose carriages had been ordered half an hour later one premature departure will cast a blight upon your small dull party whereas from a scene of real mirth the nine muses and three graces might all slip away unmissed and unobserved End of chapter nine